want to see your church grow. This is a movement that will continue beyond the gathering. We are going to give you proven systems and tested tools to create a culture of disciples making disciples. Go back to your community not only inspired, but equipped to live the disciple making movement. First Apostolic Church, Maryville, Tennessee, August 29th through 31st. Registration opens February 1st. Praise the Lord this evening. If you would stand to your feet, we're excited to be in the house of the Lord on this Sunday night. I have just a couple of announcements, and we have a special, special treat for you. As you can see, uh, Brother Nolan made the announcement this morning, but I made uh, the ob observation in walking uh, out my door to come to church that somebody needs to mow the yard, and I think that somebody might be me, but the uh, seasons are changing, and we need to make sure that we keep God's house looking as uh, trimmed and as proper as possible. And some of the greatest people in all the world, they volunteer and keep this up year round. And we have our, we have our veteran mowers around here um, who, uh, who do it year in and year out. But we're, we're looking to recruit some new uh, people onto the mowing team. And we're going to have a special meeting on Wednesday night over in the Connect Room uh, right outside of these doors over here. And we'll remind you of that. But if you can make plans to be there, uh, it's just a great time and a great team. Again, our Dream Team Banquet is quickly approaching. And the, uh, the sign-ups for that is shutting down tonight. So if you have not done that, Make sure that you get that done, and uh, we want to spend a great, great time of fellowship and honoring all the volunteers here uh, at First Apostolic Ch Church for the year of 2022. Um, we, we know that we did our missions commitment uh, cards this morning, and uh, we want you to continue to pray about that uh, in the week to come and turn in that perforated spot. Uh, torn off piece at the bottom, and just know that when you're looking through, there are some missionaries. In fact, there's a number of missionaries on this, this top portion here. Um, and when you give, you're giving to support all of them. You're giving to support even some that are not on here, like the Rodriguez family that we uh, interviewed this morning and how encouraging that was to hear of all the great things that are happening because of uh, you great and faithful people. We have a great treat tonight, and that is our youth choir is going to open up and lead us in worship. And we're thankful for the Strong Tower students here at First Apostolic Church. 
these are some of the greatest students in all the world. And uh, we felt it would be uh, great to bring uh, one of our seniors here of Apostolic Christian Academy to open up service tonight. I want you to give a big uh, hand to Brother Landry Preston as he comes to open us up tonight. Thank you, Brother Zach. Praise the Lord, church. Uh, as Brother Zach said, this amazing youth choir will be singing tonight. And they'll be singing that our praise opens the prison doors. This should obviously be a familiar passage to each of us. It's found in Acts 16, 25 through 26. It says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly, God isn't a, a God that waits. He works suddenly. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. We tonight, each and every one of us, can shake the foundation of this building with our praise and worship. Just as Paul and Silas's chains were broken, our chains can be broken. Our problems, our adversities can flee tonight just with our voice. Whatever adversity you walked in here with, I don't know what life may have dealt you. I don't know what card you may have been dealt tonight, but you and God do. Whatever it may be, whatever you walked in here with, God is greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He is stronger, he is more powerful, he is mightier than any adversity you have. As pastor preached this morning, the devil is roaming and seeking whom he may devour. Let's quiet the devil's roar with the roar of our praise and worship. Because he's worthy, church. He's worthy of all of our praise. Let's lift up our hands. Let's lift up our voice, oh God. Lord, you are worthy of all that we are, oh Lord. Oh God, you broke the chains of Paul and Silas. Lord, you can break the chains of every member of this church tonight. Lord, be with us, oh God. Have your way in this place through the miraculous night. You are worthy, oh Lord. You are able to do exceeding exceedingly abundantly all that we can even ask or think oh god be with us tonight in jesus name worship with them as they sing
Worship our God for who he is. God, you're worthy today,
your hands to the Lord. If you feel that he's in the room right now. Oh, I feel his presence in this place right now. I believe this would be a perfect time in the service to go to prayer. If there's anybody in this place that has a need, could you just make that known by the lifting of your hands? As you look across the audience, you see the hands that are lifted. You see across the choir, those that have turned needs online. I believe the Lord that we heard about this morning, that we hear preached about, that if we will open up our mouth, if we will open up our mouth, you say, well, he, he knows my heart, he knows my thoughts, but if you'll open up your mouth, there's something different that happens. And I wanna challenge you for a moment to lift both your hands and to tilt your head back, and I want you to lift up your voice and make that need known to God. Come on, lift it up right now. Whatever it is, God, I pray right now for Sister Mitchie to continue to heal her. God, I pray right now, God, for Sister Step, that you would reach down right now and touch. God, I pray over every need that's gonna be scrolling across the screen, every need that's been turned in online. Lord, every need that's in the comment section, every person, oh God, that's in this place that's lifted their hand, you see their heart, oh God. You see their need, oh God, but most of all, you hear it right now as we bind together as a church as we bind together as brothers and sisters of like precious faith right now to call upon the name of the Lord. And you said, God, if we call upon your name, Lord, that you'll heal the sick. God, that you'll heal our land. God, that you'll touch and you'll change, oh God. Lord, I feel you in this place right now. I ask that you walk up and down this, uh, this, this room, up and down every aisle. God, freely tonight, whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, God, we surrender to you. We surrender our needs. We surrender our lives. Lord, and we surrender this service to you, oh God. Whatever you want to do in this place tonight, whatever you want to do in this place tonight, come on, if you believe right now that you're more than a conqueror because you have a voice that you can call upon the name of Jesus, would you just lift up a shout right now? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
I'm walking on tribals. Death has no hold on me. today, Jesus. Let's just lift up a hand to heaven right now and thank him for being our deliverer in this place. He's our power. He's everything we need. God, you're everything we are and everything we'll ever need, Lord, is in your name, Jesus. Deliver.
Come on, can we lift our hands all across this house for the Spirit of the Lord is here. Come on, to the weary, to the brokenhearted, I've got to ask you a question. If God has done it for you before, what makes you think this is any different? If God brought you out before, what, they, what makes you think He won't do it now? But rejoice, my child, because if God has done it before, He will do it again. If God has brought you out before, if God has brought you through before, His power has not diminished. He has not become weaker. He is not a lesser God, but He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's the God that brought the children out of Egypt. He's the God that can heal and the God that can deliver. What makes us think that it's any different now? What makes us think, has he forgotten about us? Are we not doing our purpose? If God has done it before, I've got good news. God is going to do it again. God's going to do it again. Any, any attack of the adversary, it's nothing to God. If they tried to burn down Jerusalem, it's nothing to him. If they tried to persecute the church in the book of Acts, it's nothing to him. And what makes us think that our problems are too big for God? What makes us think that God can't bring us out? I serve a deliverer. I serve a deliverer. I wonder, can we throw all that mess out of the way? And can we put God in his rightful place to be high and lifted up? You ain't gonna stop the church. You ain't gonna stop the truth. You ain't gonna stop the vision that God has for us. Because he's a deliverer. Because he's a deliverer. And I think this service is, is just in order of what God wants to do. Because at the beginning of this service, at the beginning of this service, we were reminded why we do what we do. At the beginning of this service, those young people that filled this middle section, we were reminded of what we were called to do. You're, you know the reason we're here tonight worshiping God twice on Sunday? Because that group of kids right there. You know why these parents are giving it all they got in worship? It's because of those kids in them. Don't stop now. We're not stopping now, but we'll keep on going. And God will see us through. Could we lift our hands and rejoice that we serve a deliverer? Come on, what makes us think that it's any different? What makes you think in your problem that has God forgotten about you? No, he's still a deliverer. He's still a way maker. He's still a promise keeper. God's power has not diminished. He'll see us through. If you believe that, would you clap your hands in this place? Hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you may make your way back to your seats. I can't wait to see what God does through his word tonight. How many enjoyed part one, I'm sure, of a mini-part series about the seasons, about pastor preaching today? How many enjoyed that today? I know I, I look forward to I was upstairs trying to judge when we should bring Kids Quest to a close. And it's about 11.50, and I saw on the screen it was season one. Got to thinking... Uh, and uh, we know I, I look forward to what God's going to do in the rest of that series. I, I enjoyed it on the webcast today, but I know you great people enjoyed it this morning. Can we give our pastor a big hand clap? Because I know that he's going to do a great work tonight through God's Word. The ushers would make their way forward. Just a few more things. Pastor Hammond did a wonderful job with our announcements tonight. Next Sunday morning, we made this announcement in Kids Quest, and I had a split crowd. I had... A, a, a certain group of people just screaming to the top of their lungs. I hope you heard them downstairs. And then I had some, the other group was, it looked like they just, as Pastor said, was born on the dark side of the moon and drank pickle juice. Is that correct, Pastor, something like that? I had, I announced that Sister Flannery had this wonderful idea of a royal tea party for our Kids Quest students. I announced it today and those girls went crazy. You'd have thought something happened to them boys. But next Sunday morning, next Sunday morning, we are having a Kids Quest party, and it is a royal tea party. We know as children of God that we're adopted. We're adopted by a king. When you enter into the family of God, you, are, you have royal blood flowing through your veins. And uh, we, we're learning about that this, this month in Kids Quest. 
And next Sunday morning, uh, we're going to have a royal tea party, and you do not want to miss it. Uh, the big kids, you're going to stay in here, but we're going to have tons of fun with the Kids Quest students. And that is next Sunday morning uh, at 10 o'clock. Do not miss that. Got to thinking about our offering and, and our missions commitment service just this whole day of, our, of thinking what we can do to commit to missions. And, you know, the, the thought of every person who has the option of giving is what does my... $10 bill or what does my $20 bill matter in such a great group of people like this or the, the, the need is so great what does my small little offering matter to God well we can ask Moses in the beginning part of the chapter it starts as the rod of Moses but then Moses makes a decision he God says what's in your hand he said it's just a rod it's just a walking stick but a few verses later, something happens. Moses makes a decision to give what he, he's got in his hand to God. Then we see in the beginning part of that chapter, it's the rod of Moses. But then at the end of the chapter, we see it's the rod of God. It starts as the rod of Moses, but by the end, he makes a decision. I'm going to give you this. And then it becomes the rod of God. Because in the, if, if the rod is in Moses' hand, it's just a walking stick. But if the rod is in God's hand, it's a Red Sea splitting. If, if the rod is in Moses' hand, it's just simply something to get him down these steps. But if it's a rod in God's hand, it's a stick being thrown on the floor and it becomes a serpent and eats all the other serpents up. If it's just a stick in Moses' hand, it's just a walking stick. But if it's a rod in God's hand, it's water coming forth out of a rock to, to, to nourish the people of Israel. So it's the same question tonight. It might just be $10 in your hand, but what is that in God's hand? It might just be, a, in, our, in this day, it's just a thing of eggs, I guess, $10 bill. But what can it do in God's hand? Because if we could give to a mission tonight, we just might be the very means that a deliverer shows up in someone's life all across the world. And I, I've got to tell you, I've got a burden tonight because I saw it firsthand. I saw it firsthand just last week the results of this offering that many think that this is just a, a pause out of the service but I saw firsthand when it's just money in our hands but when it's money in God's hands it's a German nation being to, to a, being revived with a great revival so what is it tonight is it just ten dollars in your hand or is it God changing someone's life when we give to God because it's just a rod in Moses's hand but it's a, a tool that God uses to deliver a nation when Moses trusted him with something that he saw as insignificant. It was just something so simple. He made a decision. He said, it's just, a, it's just a walking stick, but not in God's eyes. So I want you to think tonight, it's just a $10 bill in your hand, but not in God's economy, not in God's saying, if you would trust God with what you, what, what you see as small or a small amount, God can do absolutely amazing things. But the power lies here is when it goes from your hands to I give it into God's hands. And that's when God changes it. I want you to think about that in prayer. And when, when we commit to missions, it's just something small in your hands. But when you give it to God, God can do amazing things with it. Let's pray. God, we thank you today. I thank you for such a wonderful group of people. God, I thank you for all the believers that have joined here once again on this Sunday, God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I pray tonight, God, even though we may see it at, in our hands as insignificant, God, a small offering, Lord, God, in your hands, it might just be a nation, God, being able to, uh, being able to have someone come preach the gospel to them, Lord, it might be something small in our hands, but God, it might send a messenger to someone who's never heard of the name of Jesus in this great salvation message. Lord, I thank you for these wonderful people. And I thank you that, God, we have a man of God to preach to us, God, the blessings of giving. God, and I'm so thankful to be a partaker in giving unto you because it's something small in my hands. But God, when I give it to you, God, it's something great, Lord. And we thank you for this opportunity, God. And we do everything in your name, in Jesus' name. Can someone say in Jesus' name? And as our ushers wait on you, can we clap our hands for what we feel in this place? There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, then on the ground, no matter where I go, I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need, you've got this honey in the rock. Praying for an 
Sister Mitch, it's so good to see you. Did a lot of praying by faith for Sister Mitch because what we saw in the natural would not have inspired us to believe God. But what we knew by the Word of God was what kept us praying for Sister Mitch. Sister Mitch, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for, thank you for celebrating a miracle tonight. Thank you so much. Genesis 3 and 1. Genesis 3 and 1. There's an incredible spirit here tonight. There is a spirit of deliverance here. There's a spirit of power of God here tonight. I want to tell you a simple little fact. It's a simple fact tonight. I have a... My difficult job... My difficult job... Is to preach to you to believe. That's the difficult... That's the difficulty of this job. It is not difficult for God to move. Matter of fact, He wants to move. And I don't don't believe it was any coincidence that when things finally got aligned 
and the blood was shed and the mediator was set that the Holy Ghost that had not lived in a human being for 6,000 years, that the Holy Ghost, God's Spirit, came from heaven, not as a gentle summer breeze, not like some stroll, but the Bible said when things got lined up, when the blood was shed and the mediator was set in heaven, the Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. God was in a hurry. My difficulty tonight is not to convince you, not to convince God to move, is to get in your mind that God wants to touch you, God wants to move upon you. Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, I want to preach, continue to preaching tonight on the four seasons of the serpent. God, I love you tonight. Lord, I'm here to do what you called me to do. Lord, you not only called me to salvation, but shortly thereafter, you called me to preach your word. Lord, here I stand tonight, God. And I am in need of the anointing that breaks the yoke. I am in need tonight that while I preach, that your spirit will move away every spirit that's opposed to the moving of your spirit. Lord, I pray tonight that there will be souls filled with the Holy Ghost. I pray tonight, God, there will be souls that will be delivered. I know that it is your will to fill souls with the Holy Ghost. And I know that it is your will to deliver people in this room tonight. Father, if you'll help me, I will be so mindful never to glory in your presence. I am but a mortal man and limited in a lot of ways. But oh God, if you will come down tonight and you will touch my lips of clay, I can speak the eternal word of God and there will be creative power that will be re released in this place. In Jesus' name I pray, give him a shout and give him a hand praise tonight. Come on, give him a shout and give him a hand praise. Season one, four seasons of the serpent. You may be seated. Season one that we began this morning that he is a speaking. He is a speaking serpent. We went all the way through to where in the end of time, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. We begin to tell you how Jesus defeated the speaking serpent. The only way the speaking serpent can be defeated when he speaks to you is you must speak back to him the word of God. I'm sorry poetry doesn't move him and songs don't move him. But when you begin to speak the word of God back to the adversary, it is, the only, it is the only weapon, the Bible calls it a two-edged a two sword. We begin to preach, and I got into where all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof. And there was when season one came to an end. I never got to the next three seasons, but I want to thank God. There's a gentleman in this city that loves God. He loves God. He's searching for fullness of truth. He sent me a message today and he said, you have totally opened, well, the word of God has totally opened my mind. I'm studying baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm believing by faith that I'm going to, if you're watching tonight, I'm believing by faith that it won't be too long in the future. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be baptized. Somebody say the speaking serpent. And now I want to introduce you to the next serpent. And I really believe that this is just not just how I'm putting scripture together. I believe for the season of this church, I believe that what we are going through as a church, what we are going through as a people, I believe that God enlightened my mind to these verses and these passages of scripture. Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by saying, The word divination here means 
python. It means a python. She was connected to an idol group. She was connected to a false god group who had an image of a python snake. I, a few weeks ago, I hit on this subject here. This young lady had the spirit. This word divination means a python. Can I tell you when season one of the adversary won't stop you, do not relax your guard because the enemy will come in with season two. A python is a snake that kills its prey by strangulation. A python will wrap around, and I I read some things about a python that it, it has to fall upon you. A python is so large. A python is so easily seen that it, most of the time to be successful, it has to fall from a branch down upon its prey. I read to where that most of its prey immediately die of cardiac arrest, a heart attack. But if not, the python then begins to twirl and wrap around its victim and it's cutting off the breathing. It squeezes and in each time the victim begins to breathe, inhale or exhale, the python is tightening its grip. I call this the season of pressure, the serpent, the serpent of pressure. There is a serpent of pressure. There are things that you and I, that you and I will, will walk through in the spirit, that you and I will walk through in the spirit. We are quoting scripture, but just somehow we feel like there is this pressure upon our lives. We can't put our finger on it. We try to go back through our minds and repent of everything we've said, not said, done, not done. We're trying to find out what's wrong. But the spirit of Python has wrapped around and the spirit of Python is trying to squeeze the breath, is trying to squeeze the breath out of you. It has been said multiple times here Praise is our lifeline. The youth group opened up tonight that praise opens up the windows and the doors of heaven. And if there's something that Python wants to do, if Python, if the speaking serpent, if the speaking serpent cannot overcome us with his lies because we can bat him with the truth of God, Python comes and begins to squeeze and begins to tighten around us We know that there's something, we know that there's something there. He's trying to squeeze the praise out of us. He is trying to put us into a spirit of pressure. Paul, in the second book of Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 8, Paul encountered this again. He said, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia People that are doing a work for God will, will encounter trouble. Trouble is not a sign that you're out of the will of God. Trouble can be a sign that you're doing the will of God. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, pressure, pressed out of shape pressed, measured, pressed out of measure. Above strength, we were pressed so hard that it went beyond our strength in so much that we despaired even of life. Paul teeters under this pressure about life and about living life. He says in verse nine, but we have the sentence of death in ourselves. What he's saying there in a few short words, we knew that we couldn't last much longer. We just knew that the pressure we're under, we can't last much longer. We, but, but, we were, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. He is saying there, that this pressure got to the place to where he said, God, if you don't help me, I can't be helped. 
God, if you don't help me, I can't, I can't be helped. And then verse 10, he says, God delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver and in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Paul said, if you're talking about being pressured, he said, I want you to know that God will come through. Stay faithful, stay true. Hang in there, Paul is saying. Hang in there under the pressure. Don't succumb to the pressure. Don't throw in the towel with the pressure comes. The pressure is there. It's normal. You're in the process. God's making something out of you. That diamond that you have on your finger tonight, don't you know that that diamond is the product of thousands of years of pressure on a chunk of coal, but because it stayed in the ground and it stayed in pressure, it is now a most valuable gem called the diamond. Can I tell you tonight, we as a church are feeling the pressures of hell as never before. But I want to send a signal to hell tonight. I want every demon, every evil spirit to hear me loud and to hear me clear. And I hope that I'm not the only one. I'm not throwing in the towel. Hit me with the best that you've got. Put me in the pressure cooker, if you will. But by the grace of God and by the help of God, I'm going to stay in this race and not give up. Can you give him some praise right now? Pressure, 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 pressure. Hebrews 11 and 36 talks about a people in Hebrews 11, 36. Hebrews is the faith chapter of where the miracles, seas are divided and barren women give birth to children after many years. But I'm going to tell you something. There's another phase to walking by faith and that is pressure. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven thirty six and others. Wait a minute, who are you talking about others? I'm talking about those that the barren wombs that didn't give birth. I'm talking about those that didn't have a Red Sea part and others had, a, had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. I don't believe I'm stretching the word tonight. These bonds and imprisonment is a restriction of movement. That's what pressure does to you. It restricts your movement. It restricts you that you don't have all the options that you used to have. You're restricted to a certain place. I am convinced tonight that the enemy, the python of pressure, the pressure serpent, has taken many good Bible quoting people down because they succumb to restriction. They, they succumb to pressure. How much longer? God knoweth. That'd be, a good, that'd be a good thing to stick on your mirror in your bathroom. God knoweth. God knoweth. When's things going to change? God knoweth. When am I going to come out of this season? God knoweth. I've had a lot of people prophesy over me and shake me that I had to go comb my hair after it was over. Yay, this shall end in three days. Three days, it hadn't ended. But I got news for you. God knoweth. I don't know when, but I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to say, God knoweth. And with that appointed time that God knoweth, it shall come through. You won't always stay under pressure, child of God. Take courage tonight. Be of good comfort tonight. You won't always be in the season of Python. If, if, you, can, if you can just allow yourself to have faith in God, I wish somebody just say, God knoweth. God knoweth. The Bible said Jesus Christ testified about John. John the Baptist and Jesus said there wasn't a greater 
There wasn't a greater prophet. There wasn't a greater man. What a great man. Jesus is bragging on. Jesus, Jesus is bragging on this man called John the Baptist. Jesus is bragging on this man called John. Oh, John knows who he is. John heralds it out. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John says to Jesus, when Jesus comes to be baptized, John says to Jesus, says, oh no, I have need to be baptized of you. I, 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 I have need to be baptized of you. John has such confidence. John has such freedom on the shores of the Jordan River. John has such freedom as he's announcing, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But what happens to you, John, when Python sets in on you? What happens to you, John, because you said... You said this, I don't know if you understood what you were saying, John, but you made a statement about Jesus. You said it goes like this, and you can help me quote it tonight. I must decrease that he may increase. He said, I've got a ministry, I've got to decrease. Do you know sometimes pressure causes us to decrease? Sometimes pressure in our life is just what we need. We need more of that pressure. We, we, we get in places in our life when we begin to think things and we begin to have freedoms and we forget to be as thankful as we ought to. And sometimes God allows pressure to come to our life because why? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Our life is not all about us arriving to death healthy and wealthy. Our goal in life, this is not Monopoly. I, I, listen, our grand, our grand scheme here is not the game of Monopoly to where we want to end and own all the real estate and all the money and everybody else. No, no, that's not, that's not the goal. The goal of a child of God when they draw their last breath, did I do my best to tell people about Jesus? Did I do my best to lead people to Jesus? John finds himself being arrested. John finds himself, the culture changes. John finds himself being arrested and John finds himself in a prison. Sounds like restriction. Sounds like pressure. And in that prison, the same man, the same man that could say, behold the Lamb of God. Luke chapter 7 verse 19. In that prison... And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, now John's in prison. He sends two disciples to Jesus saying, art thou he that should come? Or look we for another. What happened to you, John? I'll tell you what happened to John. Pressure got to him. Pressure got to him to where he began to think in his mind, you, you know, I, I've been doing everything I should have done. I, I, I preached. I, matter of fact, I'm in prison because I rebuked the king for his immoral lifestyle. I, I, I've been doing, I, I, introduced, I introduced the Lamb of God to the world. I've been doing everything I could do. Why would I ever wind up in here? And the only way I would wind up in here is for maybe he's not who he said he was. Can I tell you that in prison, notice this. He sent two of his disciples. Look at that. John, uh, Luke 7, 19, Brother Erickson. He sent two of his disciples. Let me show you something real quick. There are some giants you can kill all by yourself. And this is a trick of the devil. It is a trick of Python to deceive you that you can live for God all by yourself. You cannot live for God all by yourself. God said, it is not good that man be alone. But oh, aren't we seeing a culture of people that, that believe, they'll tell you, they'll tell you, oh, I, I'm all right, I just don't go to church. Oh, I'm all right, I, I, just don't, I, I, I just don't go to a house of worship on a regular basis. You're not all right. You're not all right. Because there's some giants you can kill all by yourself. David, David killed Goliath all by himself. Nobody helped David kill Goliath. But David, you are going to face a giant in your life. And that giant is going to knock you down. Yeah, I'm talking about David, the giant killer. He faced a giant in his, older, in his old age. He faced a giant. And when he faced that giant, that giant knocked David down to the ground. That giant knocked him down to the ground. 
And that giant was about to take his spear and stab it through the heart of David. But David had taken some men into battle with him. And when they looked around and they saw their king laying on their back, they came up behind that giant and they took that giant's life and had it not been for the men David had with him, David would have been killed by a giant. Boy, how how does that sound to end your life? Oh, he started out good. He killed a giant. But boy, a giant got him in an end. Boy, that would really inspire all of us to be giant killers, wouldn't it? But what I'm trying to tell you tonight is get Python spirit. It has done robbed the oxygen from your brain because you think that you can make it all by yourself. You are just checking people off. I don't need you. You didn't park your car right. You didn't treat me right. You didn't say happy birthday on Facebook. You didn't do this to me. I'm Xing you out. I'm Xing. You better be careful Xing people out of your life because one of these days you're going to need them to come around and help you and can I just tell any families that are in a little dysfunctional mode right now when I visit nursing homes when I visit nursing homes of of, of men and women that cannot even physically take care of their body they can't feed themselves anymore they can't clean themselves anymore they can't even go to the potty by themselves anymore most of the time most of the time It's not a stranger in that room. It's a son. It's a daughter. It's a daughter-in-law. It's a son-in-law. It's somebody. It's a sister. It's a cousin. So what I'm trying to tell you tonight, when Python tries to tell you to write your kids off and Python tries to tell you to write family members off, you're going to need them one day. You just may need them to come down to that nursing home when nobody else would have patience with you, when nobody else would like to bathe you. You just may... I'm talking about Python tonight. We have a book in the Bible called the book of Jeremiah. Matter of fact, we not only have Jeremiah, we not only have Jeremiah, we have Jeremiah and Lamentation. Jeremiah the prophet wrote both Jeremiah and Lamentation. But can I tell you something tonight? You'd have never had Jeremiah and Lamentation had it not been for an Ethiopian. And the Bible calls him an Ethiopian, which, which separates him from a Jew. He had a darker skin complexion than the Jews did. But when Jeremiah is knee deep in the city sewer, because that's where they put him to die. They put him in the city sewer to die. He's knee deep in the city sewer. He's about to die. Rats running around, rodents. Smell is horrible. And he's about to die. There was a man by the name of Ebek Limek that came, an Ethiopian. And he said to the king, he said, he's going to die down there in that dungeon. And the king gave him permission. The king gave him permission to go down. And oh, Ebek went down with ropes and cloths. And he threw some cloths, some old rags down. And he said, Jeremiah, put them up under your armpits. This is in the Bible. He said, put them up under your armpits, Jeremiah. And said, I'm going to throw this old rope down. Put that rope under your armpits. You know what he was saying? I don't want that old rope just cutting away at your skin. I don't want that old rope just digging into your skin. I, I, I want that cloth to cushion that, that rope as we pull you out of there. You would have never had Jeremiah and lamentation hadn't somebody come around and said, you got the spirit of Python on you and I'm going to pull you back. I'm going to pull you up out of there. That's why I'm telling you the church of the living God has never had a race issue. We have never had the church. I'm not talking about society. I'm talking about the church. We have never had a race issue. Oh God, help me. The spirit of Python that pure spirit of python you keep writing people off your list you keep writing people off your list you, you, you keep Xing people off you keep you, you keep Xing them off your life and you're going to find yourself all alone one day and the devil's going to say i got you right where i want you 
I got you right where I want you. Can I tell you something, friend? We've been going through a trial and we've been going through a test and we've been holding on to God's unchanging hand. But I'm going to tell you, I have a greater appreciation for this church family like I have never had before. We're stronger right now than we've ever been. We're stronger right now as a church. We're having numbers in attendance right now that we have never had in this church. We're not even in a Sunday school drive right now. And we're having numbers that, that, are, that, that, that we're breaking record after record after record after record. Can I tell you right now that if it wasn't for the praying saints of God, if it wasn't for the praying people that send a text, we're praying for you. Hang in there. God's with you. I'm so glad I didn't run you off. I'm so glad that I didn't act you out of my life because there was a giant that could have taken me down. But sh- I'm going to tell you right now, I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for the prayers of the saints of God. You can keep Xing people out of your life. Go ahead. Go ahead. Grab your family up and leave this church. There'll come a day that you wished that your children would have made friends with the kids in this church. Ah, you know, yeah, I know them. Yeah, I know them. I'll tell you what I know about them. I know that our youth group, at its very worst, is better than the world's youth group at its very best. I just spent I just spent four days with the juniors and the seniors of ACA, Sister Carpenter, myself in Orlando, and on the same floor with them, same floor, same floor. I know I sleep good, but I thought I asked Brother Hammond. I said, man. I didn't hear a peep out of them. I mean, same floor. They had nothing going on. Same floor. Same floor. The only thing that happened, somebody knocked on my door. I looked out the little peephole. Didn't see anybody. Very careful how I was opening the door. And I looked down. I saw my grandson, Beckham, running. <laughs> I said, Beck, Beck, you knock on my door? He pointed to his daddy. He said, my daddy told me to do it. Yeah, I know. Somebody breaks up with this one. Some boy does this wrong. Some girl does that wrong. I, I, get, how to, I get how all that goes. And I'm just going to tell you something. If your child is not mature enough to be broke up with, they shouldn't be dating. You know I'm preaching. But I'm going to tell you something. There's thousands of people that regret the day they picked their children up and took them out those doors. Python will make you do crazy things. You're going to need, you're going to need your church. You're going, to need, you're going to need your family. You know, it isn't by chance that the final battle that Jesus fought was not on the cross. He did not fight a battle on the cross. He fought the battle in the Garden of Gethsemane. Is it any coincidence that Gethsemane is a place where whole grapes are brought and crushed so that the juices will flow? The final test of Jesus' humanity life was in a place called Gethsemane. And we could call it the place of Python where it wrapped around him till what was on the inside of him came out that press. I want you to hear me. The pressing serpent. The pressing, the pressing serpent. Listen to this very clearly tonight. When Satan knows he doesn't, when Satan knows it doesn't matter how much pressure he puts on you. Listen to this verse of scripture. There hath no temptation Pressure taken you, but such is common to man. But God will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. I don't know how much I can take. I got good news. 
God does. And if I'm taking a little bit more, it's all because God knows I'm capable of taking a little more. When Satan knows it doesn't matter how much pressure he puts on you, you're not giving in. You won't change your mind about God and God will never change his mind about you. He will then go. He then goes to cause people to change their mind or opinion or thoughts or questioning motives about you. I introduce to you tonight the third season. He is a slandering serpent. Slandering. He will slander you. If you quote scripture and push him back, he'll come back with python. But if you endure python, he'll come back with slander about your name. Somebody will slander you. Somebody will misinterpret something you've done. Somebody, that kind deed that you did, somebody will slander that kind deed. Let's go to Scripture to find this out. Paul and 275 other passengers have floated ashore after weeks in a storm and the ship has been torn apart. Paul, along with 275 other passengers, float to the shore of this island on broken pieces of the ship. In Acts chapter 28, verse number 3, when they floated ashore, there were, that island was inhabited by heathen people, godless people. They were heathens, they were godless, but they were kind. They saw these 276 water-soaked men and they began to build fires for them. In Acts chapter 28 and verse number three, it says, and when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came out a viper out of the fire, out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Say those last three words with me. On his hand. Where was the viper at? On his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffer, suffereth not to live. Watch this. At first, he's a water-soaked man that comes ashore and they have compassion. These, these barbarians have compassion on him and they build a fire. Paul gets up and begins to help gather sticks and when he does, a viper, a cobra, attaches itself to Paul's hand. And when Paul saw this viper that attached itself to the hand, the people changed their view of Paul. They looked at him not as a man that needed to be saved, but they said among themselves, this must be a murderer. This must be a wicked man that vengeance suffered him not to live. Look, the sea tried to kill him. And now, now a viper, a viper has attached itself. So now, can't you see what's happening now? Now the people around Paul, the people that Paul wants to eventually preach to, is now looking at him not through compassionate eyes, but they're looking at him like he's a murderer. He, he, he's evidently done, done something bad because that serpent 
if he can't get you through, if he can't get you through speaking lies, and if he cannot get you through python of pressure, he will then try to get somebody to talk about you, somebody to slander you. Come on, church. You've got to get a hide tougher than letting somebody run their mouth about you. There's always been gossipers. There's always been slanders. There's always been people running their mouths. But for God's sake, don't let them run you out of church. Oh, Brother Carpenter, they're saying this about you, Brother Carpenter. Do, you know, do, do you all know what that sweet spot is of when you, when you get in the bed and you, you, you're just right in between being awake and going to sleep, it's, it, it's, it's heavenly. It, it, it's just that one little spot. That, just that one little spot. It's heavenly. The blankets are just right. The pillow's just right. The dogs are positioned just right. The wife's over here. It's just right. The fan's going overhead. My wife read me something on the way to church. She said, you, you, ever, you ever thought people can sleep through a tornado? They can sleep through a, a, a siren going off. They can sleep through a train coming beside their house. But just turn the fan off and you're wide awake. Oh, I was in that sweet spot. And off in the distance, I began to hear, Kenny, Kenny. And then I heard, Kenny Ray. <laughs> and I'm laying like this. Let's look over at her. And she's there. And she's halfway setting up. And she said, doesn't it bother you what people are saying about you? Doesn't it bother you what people are saying about you? Is this going to get deep here? I said, no. It don't bother you? I said, absolutely not. Because it's lies. You see, too many of you are believing what the slanders are saying about you. You cannot help it. God has allowed for that to be a serpent of slander, but don't let it take your peace. I am not what they're saying. We are not what they're saying. Come on, if you've been slandered, you ought to be shouting right now. I'm not what they've said about me. That's why I can go to sleep is I don't believe what they're saying about me. Slander. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Acts 28. I hope it's all right tonight. When the barbarian saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer. Whom though he hath escaped to see, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Albeit, Luke, you wrote Acts. You had to be from East Tennessee. Only an East Tennessee person could put three words together. How be it? <laughs> How be it when they looked? And when he should have swollen and fallen down dead suddenly. But after they looked a great while and so no, saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a God. This is why you can't live by public poll opinions. They either have you as a murderer, I'm not that, or they have you as a God, and I'm sure not that. But I'll tell you what I am going to do. They were watching him. He ought to be swollen by now. They were watching him. He ought to be sweating by now. They were watching him. He ought to fall over dead by now. They were watching him. But when that didn't happen to him, they had to change their minds. 
If you're waiting for me to be bitter, you just better go somewhere else. If you're waiting for me to write a resignation letter, you better go somewhere else. If you're waiting for me to tell this church, well, we tried our very best. It looks like the devil's knocked us out. You better go somewhere else because I'm going to prove... Come on, we are the church. We are the mighty church of Jesus Christ. I don't care what they're saying about us right now. They're going to change their minds because I'm going to keep on ministering. Hey, let's take a praise break right now. I'm still going to pray for them. I'm still going to call the names out of those that, that ridicule. I'm still going to pray. Where'd that viper hang? I'm going to see if you're listening to me now. Where's that viper hanging? He shook it off in the what? Look at verse number eight. And it came to pass. It came to pass. That's another way of saying after they changed their mind and said he's a God. That the father of Cubulus lay sick of a fever of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed. Please don't miss this. Please don't miss this. Paul entered in and prayed and laid his. You'll never have healing hands to have overcoming hands. You'll never have a healing ministry to have an overcoming ministry. Paul's snake bit hand was laid on the man's head and he was healed. Some of the best people to pray for you is people that went through what you're going through and have been overcomer and they come and pray for you. That's why when they call discouraged pastors up at camp meetings and conferences, we got discouraged pastors, would you come pray? I go through there, Brother White, laying my hands on, well, no, no man, you're the man of the Maribel miracle. You're the man of all, you're the man, you're the man of the missions given. You're the man, no, 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 no. I'm a man that's overcome discouragement. I'm just a man that overcome all of hell's vices that he did. And I'm an overcomer. What better man to lay their hands on and pray than somebody that's overcome? Now stay with me for a moment. Stay with me for a moment. The first 40 years of Moses' life was spent in Egypt. He was raised in Pharaoh's palace. Moses could have seen firsthand the power of the word of Pharaoh. Just speak the word and a person loses their life in the presence of Pharaoh. Just speak one word, Pharaoh. Just speak one word, Pharaoh. And a person could, could, could become very wealthy. A person could lose their life. But just the word of Pharaoh. A person could have great riches. Just one word from Pharaoh. Is it any coincidence that Pharaoh wore around his head a golden cobra? Around his turban was a golden cobra. The cobra is chosen because a cobra can spew its venom farther than any other snake. A cobra doesn't have to bite you. He can spew his venom. And they said the most dangerous place that you can receive the venom from the cobra is in your eyes. Moses was well acquainted Moses was well acquainted. There were serpents, statues, cobras, statues all over Egypt. He was well acquainted. Pharaoh wears a golden cobra around his turban because it, it was indicative of all Pharaoh has to say. It's a word, death, life. Moses takes things into his own hands. He kills an Egyptian. 
he kills an Egyptian. And in Exodus chapter 2, verse number 15, it says, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he heard that he had killed an Egyptian. Moses killed an Egyptian. He sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. The first 40 years he lived in fear. No doubt he lived in fear. Will Pharaoh find me? Don't you know for 40 years the most powerful man in the world Can Pharaoh find me? A stranger came to town. Is this somebody from Pharaoh? For 40 years, Moses lived in fear that Pharaoh's warrant would be served and Moses would surely meet death. But one day, while tending to his father-in-law's sheep, Moses sees the most unusual sight. He saw a bush that was burning. But what made this bush very unusual was the bush was not being consumed. It was burning and burning and burning. Moses approaches the bush to look at the bush. Upon that, he hears a voice out of the burning bush that tells him to remove his shoes. He's standing on holy ground. There at that burning, there at that burning bush, there at that burning bush, God began to tell Moses, you're going to go back down into Egypt. That's what I fear most. You're going to go back to Egypt. No, 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 no. I fear Egypt the most. You're going to go back to Egypt and you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. There's a covenant of Abraham here and you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And it's a long chapter, Moses offering excuse after excuse. But in Exodus chapter 4, verse number 1, and Moses answered and said, but behold, God, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, Brother Nolan, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it, cast it on the ground. Now stop right here for a moment. Of all the things that God could have chosen to turn that rod into, all the things that God could have chosen to turn that rod into, he could have chosen to turn the rod into a bow and arrow. That would make sense. I'm going to war. He could have chosen to turn that rod into a spear, a sword. We're going to war. But God, why do you turn that rod into a serpent? i tell you why. I can never use you until you face your fears. Some people come into this church, they're masked up to the hilt. But you ain't gonna last long because you're trying to cover up your fears. You need to take all the mask off and you need to face your fears. When Moses throwed that rod down and that rod became a serpent, Moses just didn't flee from that rod because it was a serpent. He fled because of everything that rod represented. I've been running from Egypt. I've been fearing Egypt for 40 years. I've seen all these serpents down. I've seen all these serpents down in Egypt. I've been running. Stop running. Stop running. Stop running tonight. God has called you to face your fears. God has called you not to mask, not to peel, not to drink down. You've got a past and you need to face that past and there's no greater way to face that past past than Jesus Christ. He can help you on your past. Well, you don't know how many times I've failed. You need to understand that's facing your past. He said, reach down and pick it up. He had a stick, wood. It turned into a serpent, flesh. He reached down and picked it up. It turned back into a stick. Won't you see that? Won't you see that? 
he gets brave enough to go down and stand Brother Troy into Pharaoh's throne room. And Pharaoh says, just what makes you think I ought to let all the slaves go? Give me a sign from your God. Moses took that rod, threw it down on the ground, and that wood rod became a fleshly reptile. Pharaoh stood back for a moment. Let me show you this. You've got to read it very closely. The Bible said Pharaoh called his magicians, and they did in like manner. They didn't change anything. Only God can take something of one ingredient and turn it into something else. Only God can turn water into wine. Only God can take a substance of wood, turn it in to a reptile, turn it back in to a wood rod. And Brother Sincata, Pharaoh just looked and said, look, that's a cheap magician's trick. That's just a cheap hocus pocus trick. But something happened. The Bible says that Moses' rod, serpent, opened its mouth and swallowed all of Egypt's supposing serpents, shut its mouth and then turn back into a rod. I want you to see this with me tonight. The rod represents God in eternity. He is spirit by nature. He is spirit by nature. God came down to earth and became flesh, became flesh to do what? To open up his mouth on Calvary and to devour all of the sin of the world, shut its mouth. And now in Christ Jesus is the DNA of victory, is the DNA of an overcomer. Can I tell you tonight, there's no greater name than the name of Jesus. There's no greater power than the name of Jesus. Do you see this? Did not Jesus say, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, if the Son of Man be lifted up, I will draw all men nigh unto me. Can I tell you, the name of Jesus has overcome every sin, every habit. You can overcome every habit in the name of Jesus. There is not a problem you cannot, you cannot overcome. There is not a situation that's bigger than your Jesus. There is not a situation that Jesus has to say, I'm sorry. Jesus is not like a doctor that says, I've done all I can do. When you call out on the name of Jesus, he is able, he is able to overcome. The speaking serpent. The pressuring serpent. The speaking serpent, the pressuring serpent. Boy, haven't we worked on that old slandering serpent. But I think it's time. It's amazing how the Bible has bookends to it. Genesis 3 all started this sin issue with a speaking serpent. Genesis 3. A speaking serpent. But there's coming a day in Revelation chapter 20, verse number one. It's bookends, isn't it? Genesis, Revelation. Genesis 3, he's a speaking serpent. Revelation 20, he's still running his mouth. He's still running his mouth. Revelation 21, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I could say it this way. He shut him up for a thousand years. He shut his mouth. You've been speaking for thousands of years, Satan. But you're going to be shut up and bound for a thousand years. I don't know about you, but that's that, that, somebody, if they had a car, they ought, to do, they ought to do circles of victory tonight. This is victory. This is victory. He's going to be shut up one day. 
He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, oh, I like that, and shut him up, oh, I like that, and shut him up, oh, I like that, and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. I'm telling you, that old serpent started running his mouth in Genesis 3. That's why we've got disease. That's why we've got crime. That's why we've got drug addiction. That's why we've got people dying before they ought to die because of that speaking serpent. But there's coming a day when God is going to come down with a great chain. Now listen to me tonight. I'm closing, I'm closing. But listen, please listen to me tonight. I believe that what will literally happen in the book of Revelation, we can experience it now in the church. How's that? Paul said that we put Satan where? Now if you're smart, I don't want the serpent's tail under my foot. But Paul said, you put his head under. I think that's another way of shutting him up. You see, a lot of things could go to changing if we just learn how to shut him up. As a matter of fact, chapter 20 of Revelation talks about him being shut up. No wonder chapter 21, verse number 1, starts out by saying, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And then chapter 22, verse number 1, starts out by saying, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Do you know something? God can never show you things until you shut Satan up. God is wanting to show you there's victory in your marriage. God is wanting to show you your children are going to grow up to be mighty prayer warriors. Your children are going to grow up to love God and do an awesome work in the spirit. But as long as we're listening to the devil right off, as long as we're listening to this and listening to that, he can't show you anything. He can't show you anything until you shut him up. You ought to refuse to allow gossip to come into your home. You ought to refuse. You you hear me tonight? You ought to refuse to let talk about the saints of God come into your home. You ought to shut him up. You ought, when, when that comes across your dinner table and somebody wants to say what this girl did and what that boy did and what this boy did and what that, you ought to say, time out, shut up. We don't do that here at our house. We're talking about what God is going to do with our children. We're talking about what God, I'm going to tell you, if we could bind the devil's voice because, listen, it's not innocent gossip. It's not innocent slander. It's of the devil. It's of hell. And it's going to run souls. We got to shut it up. Can I tell you that during that 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ, when Satan is shut up for a thousand years, nature begins to change. Isaiah 11 and verse 6. Isaiah's telling you what's going to happen during this 1,000 year reign. Isaiah 11 verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of an ass that, that's a spider. And the winged child shall put his hands on a cockatrice den. That's other spiders. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. If you shut him up, nature changes. You shut him up, you'll begin to see the people of God through a different lens. You shut him up, 
and people that you X'd off your list long time ago, you're going to get a desire. You're going to go have lunch with them. You're going to make that friendship right again. And things, people are going to say, man, look at those two coming in. That's right. The cow and the bear. That's exactly right. Because when we get nature changed, things begin to change. How many want to change in your life? How many is tired of letting the adversary rule? Listen to this. You say, why don't people live long like they did in the Bible days? I'll tell you why. They're not living eight, nine hundred years. The speaking serpent. Because he started off speaking and you can just trail it all through the book of Genesis. The age just keeps going down, 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 down. Till we're promised. Three score and ten. And then it says, you're real blessed, a little bit more be added to that. But listen to what happened during the millennial. Isaiah 65 and 20. Isaiah 65, 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled, not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? We've all been celebrating this week such a great, tremendous woman of God, Sister Vesta Mangan. We've all been celebrating on social media. She celebrated her 97th birthday this week. 97 years old. And the woman's going strong. Just going strong. Sister Carpenter, we were looking at the post and she said, oh God, let me live that long. Let me, let me. But she's great. She's a tremendous woman of God. But if she dies in the next couple years, people stand there at her funeral and say, she lived a long time. But do you know during the millennial reign of 1,000 years, when Satan is shut up, that if a child, uh, somebody dies and they're a hundred years old, they'll come to the funeral and say, just a babe, just a child. Why? Because that length of life is going to start being added back in. Why? Because he's our trouble. See, if you can just understand tonight, it's not the government. Stop blaming one party over the other. If we can get the adversary where he needs to be tonight, you watch the nature change in your life. Speaking serpent. A pressing serpent. A slandering serpent. And the last one, a silent serpent. Oh, I just want to silence him. Would you just stand with me? And I just want to silence him right now. I silence you from my thoughts. I silence you from my thought processes. I silence you from all the past mistakes that I've made. Satan, can you not see that I have been forgiven? I have been washed. I silence you tonight. Come on, church. Come on, pray with me tonight. I I silence you, Satan. I silence you. You shall not bring that past back up. I I silence you right now. I I silence you in my life right now. I silence you right now. I, I take authority over you right now. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over you right now. I silence you right now. Oh, please pray, church. Oh, please pray, church. I silence you right now. I silence you right now. I I silence that adversary right now. Some of you are so tormented. You need to begin to proclaim boldly. I silence you over my life. I am not going to die prematurely. I am not going to die from what my parents died from. I am not going to die of this disease. I am not going to die. I am an overcomer. I am a new creature in Christ. Come on, I need some intercessors in this house tonight. Oh, God. Oh, God. 
Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, I need some intercessors right now. Please, in the name of Jesus, stop running from your fear right now. Stop running from your fear right now. Let go of the back of that pew and march to this altar. Silence the adversary. Silence his voice. Silence him right now. Silence him right now. I beg you in the name of Jesus. I plead with you in the name of Jesus. Victory is waiting on you. A change in your life is waiting on you. I rebuke the speaking serpent. Come on, Cole. Come on, I want you to move as close up around the altar as you can. Come on, move as close up around the altar as you can. Oh my God, I silence you right now. I silence you right now, enemy. I silence you right now, enemy. I silence you by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. I silence you by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Satan, you don't recognize my name, but you recognize his name. I silence you in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I wish a husband would get a hold of a wife. Oh, God. Jesus. Silence him. Come on, let's don't play church. Let's don't play. It's warfare. It's warfare. I silence you tonight. I silence you tonight. I silence you. You devil of division. You devil of distraction. You devil that's robbing us of our peace. I silence you in the name of Jesus Christ. Silence him.
I want us right now, I want us right now, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong to come back here to pray for one specific need. And I want to, do, I want to divide this up tonight. Your brain is an organ just like your heart, just like your heart, your lungs, liver. Your brain is the organ just like that. And they're possible, just like you can have heart trouble, you can have chemical imbalance, you can have things in your brain that triggers different emotions, different things of depression that go on. Won't you just take that and put that to the side right now? Because this is what I want to address tonight. This is what I want to address tonight. I want to address thoughts, ingrained opinions that you have of yourself because of how you were treated in life or wasn't treated. And you have in your mind a spirit that you're not worthy. You'll never measure up. You don't look like a Barbie doll. And I don't look like G.I. Joe. And because of that, young girls battle in their mind. It has nothing to do with their brain. They've allowed the enemy. And I'm going to tell you something. The Bible said Jesus healed a woman who had the spirit of infirmity. Well, what infirmity did she have? She had a spirit of infirmity. She didn't have infirmity. She had just somehow allowed, she had just somehow allowed the spirit of that infirmity to come in. Just like I battled, I battled. I was glad to celebrate my set. I was glad to celebrate my 47th birthday. You know why? Because I had a voice inside of my head telling me that I would be dead just like my dad was. My dad died at 46. And I had that inside of my head. Nothing wrong with my brain. Just just how life, things that happened in life, put that inside of my head. And through the Holy Ghost, it's the only way you can combat a spirit, is through the Holy Ghost. But I'm telling you right now, I'm not telling you, I'm not talking about your physical brain of what you've been diagnosed with in your physical brain. I'm not touching that tonight. I'm talking about the spirit that the enemy has rode into your brain you feel unworthy. You feel your second best. That's why you're willing to settle for second best in life. Because you feel like your second best. But in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not sorry we stopped the music. I'm going to tell you something. If music can stop a move of God, it wasn't a move of God. But I want us to pray right now because I want some people to leave this altar different than what they came. We're going to rebuke the spirit that tries to come into our minds right now. Come on with me right now. I got to have your help. You want to put your hand over on the side of your head? You do that. I'm now a new creature. I am now a new creature. I'm not what I used to be. My past is underneath the blood. I have been filled with the Holy Ghost. I am a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. I am not what anyone says about me or thinks about me. I am not what was done to me. I am not unwanted. God has a plan for me. Come on, there's going to be a move of the Holy Ghost. Come on, there's going to be a move of the Holy Ghost. I have a great future before me. I have a tremendous future before me. I am a daughter of the Most High God. I am a son of the Most High God. I have royal blood flowing through my veins. My God. My God, I am somebody. I am somebody. I will never entertain those thoughts again. I will never feel sorry for myself. No, not another minute. I'll never feel sorry for myself.
myself. Oh my God. Come on, I will never feel sorry for myself. Tonight I break that curse. I break the curse of wanting self-pity. I break the curse of wanting to be pitied. My God, my God, my God, my God. Jesus. Jesus. If you have to go home, some of you get up early for work. I understand that. Please feel free to dismiss yourself. But I got a feeling somebody's going to stay in this altar. I refuse to be pitied. I do not want pity. I may have been forsaken by my mother and my father, but I have a heavenly father that's picked me up. Come on, young lady. Come on, young man. Come on, young man. Come on, young man. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, those of you that are staying up around the altar, lay your hand over on somebody right now. We got several young women praying right here. If some of the mothers in the church want to get on the platform and... Come on, some of you mothers want to get on the platform and pray. Come on, some of you men want to go through the audience. How great. by way of the world wide web let this same anointing come into your home right now let this same anointing come into your home right now go ahead and begin to walk around the room that you're in this same anointing and power of the Holy Ghost can be right there in your living room right there in your car wherever you may be there's a tremendous anointing in this house tonight there's a tremendous anointing that's here tonight. We have bound the adversary. We are doing right now what's going to happen to him in Revelation 20. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lay your hand over on somebody right now. Come on, lay your hand over on them right now. Oh. You're going to leave here tonight different than what you came to church. You're going to leave here different than what you came tonight. I will break this addiction. I will, through the help of Jesus Christ, I will be free. I will be drug free one day. I will be alcohol free one day. I will be nicotine free one day. I will overcome this through Jesus Christ. I will overcome it. I will overcome it. I will overcome it through Jesus Christ. I will be delivered. I will have things restored to me. I, re I will have things restored back to me. I lost my car. I will get my car back. My lifestyle caused me to lose my home. I will get my home back. Through Jesus Christ, he is going to restore. Believe it with me. All things are possible if you believe tonight. possible I will be drug free one day I will be alcoholic free one day I will be 
nicotine free one day. I will get back everything the enemy took from me. I will get back everything the enemy took from me. I'll get back the years I wasted. God will double the years back to my life. He will make me the head and not the tail. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, there's, there's war on the floor here tonight. Somebody's getting desperate. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I am not trash. I am not trash. I am not, I am not trash. I am not dirty. I am a cleansed vessel of the King. Yes. Come on, begin to declare it. Come on, begin to declare it. I will be drug free. I will be alcohol free. I will be nicotine free. I will be free. I will be free. I'm on my road to victory. I'm on my road to overcoming. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. How great. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Shout it, proclaim it. Shout it, proclaim it, believe it, get loud about it, get loud about it, get loud about it, turn the volume up, turn the volume up in your life, I will be alcohol free, I will be drug free, I will be nicotine free, our marriage will be here. I come to get it tonight. I come to get my blessing tonight. I come to shut that adversary up tonight. Ah, I speak peace over marriages. I speak peace over marriages tonight. Oh, I speak peace. I speak peace over your marriage tonight. By the authority of the one who created marriage, I speak peace over marriages tonight. I speak peace over the children tonight. Come on, do it tonight. Come on, husbands, say it loud. I speak peace over my marriage. I speak peace over my marriage. Come on, wives, speak it tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus knew what you're going to do. Jesus knew what you're going to do tonight, Lord. Oh, do what you're going to do tonight, Lord. Oh, mighty God, mighty God. Jesus. Oh, oh, I rebuke the speaking serpent. I rebuke the speaking serpent tonight. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Every tongue will be condemned in judgment. I rebuke the speaking serpent tonight with the word of God. I rebuke the pressing serpent tonight 
by pushing with all of my might. Come on, one more time. Can we push a shout out? Woo. Shout, push, shout. I left one out. The Bible said he'll descend from heaven with a great chain in his hand. You be back Wednesday night because I don't know how I'm going to make this happen. My team's going to have to help me. But I'm going to Home Depot or Lowe's and I'm going to buy me a bunch of chain. And I'm going to cut a couple links out. And I'm going to have hundreds of them here. And I want you to keep that few little links of chain in your purse, in your pocket. When you start hearing them voices, you just get that chain out. My God. If there's one thing the devil wants to addict you to, is pity. Young people that were not given parental love will then turn to the next thing they want in their life. They didn't get that. They'll then turn to pity. They want people to pity them. That's the last thing you want. You don't want to be pitied. Because then you have to go through life masked up as someone that needs pretty. Pity. While the true conqueror is somewhere underneath all that mess. The true overcomer. And so I'm going to give you a piece of chain on Wednesday night. I don't know how many hundreds I'm going to have to make. I don't know how many. Y'all got to go to work, Brother Hammond. You got to make it happen. We got to go down there and take that little saw at Home Depot. Ching, 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 ching. I'm going to have a bucket full of these little links. I want you to come get one. Because the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. I've told you everything tonight. I've told you everything today that you need. When he speaks to you, speak the word back to you. Speak the word back to him. When he pressures you, burst out with praise and worship. Burst out with praise. Burst out with worship. The best way that you can put the slander under your foot is don't listen to that junk. Then you'll get it on Wednesday night. That little piece of link. That you're going to have in your pocket. Devil, you know what this is, don't you? You better get used to this, bubby. Because you're going to wear it one day. I'm just giving you a little preview. I'm just giving you a little FAC preview of what's going to happen in Revelation 20. You're going to get bound with a big chain and your mouth is going to be shut up. I got this little course on my heart right now. I got this little course on my heart. How great is our God. Come on, now that you're all on the right key, sing it real loud right now, all right?
One more time. One more time. From your heart. That's going, to be our, that's going to be our theme song. That's going to be our theme song. How many will help me tonight? Y'all are, y'all are a good church. Y'all do what pastor asks you to do. I show you things in the Bible. You obey it. I show you things in the Bible. You just do it. I show you things out of the Bible. I'm going to ask you to do this. I want you to sing that song. I want you to sing it all by yourself. You get up in the morning and sing that song. Because our God is great. And you sing that song. I don't care what bondage. I don't care what. I don't care what's got you bound right now. If you'll learn that as your anthem, and when you get into the, you get into the fight of that habit, if you could just start singing, how great. Mighty God, Father, I love you tonight. God, keep your hand upon this church. Bring us back Wednesday night, Lord, ready to praise you, ready to worship you again. In Jesus' mighty name, give the Lord a hand of praise.